Hey everybody, uh, so 9.40, I guess I'll get started. It's always hard being the first person of the day after the keynote. I um, hope you all have coffee. Uh, my name's Donnie, he, him. Uh, I'm the last two years I've been uh, working as the engineering manager for infrastructure at Recursion. And uh, today uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about um, a tool some of you may be familiar with, some tools you may be familiar with, and also some patterns around structuring uh, your source, your infrastructure as code um, for, uh, yeah, for managing your infrastructure. Cool. All right. Okay, so I decided not to go with like your standard tech talk, vanilla tech talk today um, because I quite, fi quite frankly, I kind of find them boring. <laughs> so we're gonna go on a little adventure. Um, anybody here uh, make a New Year's resolution? Okay, so some some fellow like people who like self-loathing and you know personal failure later on in the year. <laughs> Perfect, me too. Um, so this is mine. Um, has anybody read this? Okay, the the whole thing. Oh dang. Okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah. So uh, I've been meaning to do this for years, um, and I finally convinced myself and three other poor souls to join me in an attempt to read this uh, this uh, epic in this year. And uh, it is not for the faint of hearts. Um, so Steven Erickson is trained as an archeologist, uh, a profession which I personally naively equates to being someone who really liked digging in a sandbox when they were a kid and was born with some sort of preternatural patience and dedication to like spend a lot of time dusting things off to find some sort of unique thing about history. Um, and with that completely uninformed view of what archeology span is, uh, I think it is no coincidence that Erickson, somebody who loves history, wrote uh, a saga that has north of three million words total. So um, in my younger days, I wrote, read Tolkien, and I loved Tolkien, who is a trained philologist. Uh, I loved that he wrote this prose um, that was so rich with invented languages that nevertheless, like though they were invented, it felt authentic to the world that he had created. And it did not require much when I was reading Tolkien as a child to suspend my disbelief and immerse myself in Middle Earth, right? And I am only roughly 400,000 words into this, but uh, I find the authenticity of ancient history in Erickson's writing, Erickson's writing um, similarly compelling. Now, thanks for your patience and sort of this introduction. Uh, I may be leaning too far into this metaphor, but much of what I'll discuss today was unearthed um, and surfaced through an archaeological excavation of sorts. <clears throat> and so I want to take you through a bit of a, a historical journey of my own discovery, um, the evolution of infrastructure as code at recursion from the perspective of somebody who came late to, to that, uh, that uh, organization. So uh, in case it wasn't clear, I do work for this company. I don't just spelunk through their code base <laughs> by myself. Um, but at Recursion, I'll just give you a really quick background. Uh, so we have undertaken a mission to decode biology to radically improve lives. And what does that mean? So traditional drug discovery methods are inefficient and expensive, hands down. All right, approximately 90% of all drugs in clinical trials ultimately fail to get approved. And the total investment needed to develop a single approved medicine is a, in excess of $2 billion today, all right? This inefficiency occurs because biology us is extraordinarily complex. Um, and our industry has historically lacked the tools to understand uh, how it functions. So recursion, we're harnessing the convergence of multiple breakthrough technologies that allow our scientists to explore uncharted areas of biology and unravel its complexity to navigate a path to better treatments. And we've built massive proprietary biological and chemical data sets that predict trillions of relationships across biology and chemistry uh, many of which were not known in scientific literature prior to, to that point. Um, and our approach generates novel insights, it broadens the scope of potential medicines, and it truly industrializes drug discovery, um, increasing the scale, speed, and eff efficiency of each step of the process. And I had mentioned all this to say, you know, we are truly conducting scientific inquiry at scale. Um, an anecdote that's often shared by many of our leaders who all have like PhDs and uh, fellow or postdoctoral fellowships in you know very complicated sciences will say we run more experiments in a week through a high throughput system than many of them have conducted in their entire careers 
Um, and the output of this experimentation are these vast, vast data sets of biological chemical data that we relate in the form of machine learning models. And our foundation model phenomics, so this is a press release from earlier this year, uh, Phenom 1 was trained over a purpose-built proprietary data layer of connected phenomics data, which was built from billions of images collected uh, by our automated high throughput lab. You can see some of the images here. What this is showing on the far right is the original image. This was the training set where we did selective masking at 75%, and in the middle are reconstituted images um, from the, the model. And what this gives us is an ability to leverage machines to reason over experimental data in a way that we couldn't do before. But recursion is operating at an industrialized scale. We have over 50 petabytes of data in cloud, um, including 3 billion objects in GCS. And uh, we consume over 2 million hours of GPU every year from uh, GCP. We also have a supercomputer that we also <laughs> consume a pile of compute. Um, so what we're doing is very hard in very particular ways. And um, the infrastructure that we have built and are continuing to build and the automation around it is what's enabling a lot of our scientists, data scientists, machine learning engineers to do what they do. So as mentioned, I came late to recursion. I've only been working at recursion since 2022. And uh, so a little over two years ago. And it was not until recently, uh, thanks to Ericsson and sort of my recent obsession with archeology span that I thought, you know what, let's do this dig through as many repos as I can dig through. Um, and it's pretty amazing. I, I think this is actually an incredible thing that we can do, right? We can dig through this history, these layers of change, finding little broken pieces of code or little snippets of commit messages and like put together a story of how your company got to be where it is. And that is both fascinating and edifying. Um, and so, I want to take you on a bit of that journey that I went through over the last few months. So I set myself the objective of trying to understand how my team got to own the current state of infrastructure as code of recursion and current state like today um, and also when I first joined. And like this little nugget here, uh, screen capture from GitHub, is like the first reference I could find, the oldest reference I could find to something approaching infrastructure as code. Um, Golgi here, which is a cellular component, but also, you know, uh, refers to an on-premise server that we used uh, back, back in 2014 to run these analyses over images that were taken by our microscopes. Um, and there are some references in recursion lore, if you, like, go spelunking through Slack as well, to, like, this thing. They held a funeral for it when it died because it was, like, the first thing. Uh, um, and the repository obviously retired in 2019, which I'm guessing is around the time that they probably held a funeral. I wasn't here. I could, I could ask, but it's more fun to just into it. Um, so yeah, we have this sort of like first glimpses of what you might call infrastructure as code, like some config scripts, comp files, any somewhere in there. It's not true infrastructure as code as we think of it today, but it's a start. Um, and it appears that recursion operated this way actually with these sort of mishmash of like bash scripts and you know diverse infrastructure provisioning methods and run from this computer or plug in USB key over here uh, for a number of years. And it worked. And it got us to, to 2017. But in and around this time, you know, I mean, first off, how many people can relate to like the top left quote there? Right? I'm sure a lot of people can. <laughs> you know, there is this moment where you're like, oh my God, how many times do I have to copy past to this? just to make something work, you know? Um, what did we do wrong? And um, the response to that frustration uh, at Recursion was to build the first infrastructure mono repo, um, aptly named Eng Infrastructure, you know? So less fun than Golgi, but a little bit more descriptive. Um, and it was intended to be a single place to store infrastructure configuration automation um, and help make our systems more discoverable and provide a single place where you could see what and how things were deployed. So what did it look like? Well, this is essentially basically what it looked like uh, in that early incarnation. We had a kube directory with some manifests that you would, you know, kube kettle apply. And then you had a singular <laughs> infrastructure.tf uh, and um, that would, was provisioned from local machines. So there's no real GitOps at this point. There's no real true automation, but we've at least codified infrastructure. Um, they also made this very curious decision to store Terraform state in Git, which I think was at one point recommended, but is no longer recommended. 
but I'm also very mindful, like, not as I'm going through this, not to pass judgment, right? I, I'm going to paraphrase Hippocrates a little bit. You know, don't look upon past work as having been poorly done because it did not avoid the mistakes we clearly see today, but rather admire it for its accomplishments and, you know, despite its now apparent flaws, respect that it was crafted with intention, right? This was a choice that people made. So when I look back at this, I think that see this as success, even if it's not exactly how I would do it. Um, but this is like the initial inframono This is actually the kernel, the seed from which, you know, the rest of our infrastructure's code will, will be born. Um, and so now we're kind of going into circa 2020. So another three years has gone by and we're approaching the dawn of the GitOps age at Recursion. Um, although it's not immediately, obviously that's gonna, it's gonna happen. Um, one thing we can see is that complexity has increased. So I, I've deliberately took some stuff out of the, the description of the repo. But you know, we have um, additional structure. We've got multiple clusters that we're managing now um, and, and having to ma maintain configuration for. Um, Terraform state has thankfully been migrated out of the repo and into a bucket. <laughs> Uh, and we have a Terraform directory with multiple, with a little bit more thought into how we structured um, our Terraform so that it can be reasoned over a little bit better as opposed to just infrastructure somewhere here. Um, and, you know, Ansible showed up for some reason. It disappears later. I'm not sure what happened there, but we'll, you know, I'll do more digging and report back. Um, but yeah, things are happening. We're growing, we're scaling, right? This, this, this complexity is indicative of stuff happening at the company and we're doing new things. Um, and then we see this first emergence of Atlantis. So who here is familiar with Atlantis? I'm assuming some of you, many. Okay, yeah, not too bad. So Atlantis is, uh, I guess, not in the true sense of GitOps per the definition, but it kind of, it automates the provisioning of Terraform uh, and delegates it to a, a, a non-local machine, right? Um, and foreshadowing, this, this actually is also very <laughs> impactful on my career at Recursion. Uh, and what I ended up having to deal with when I joined, um, hence the name of the talk. Um, so much like its mythical namesake, Atlantis appears, it does a bunch of stuff, and then eventually it's going to disappear, foreshadowing. Okay, so the emergence of Atlantis uh, as a tool um, precipitated a, deci a decision, and I tried to find like the discussion around this as to why they made this choice, because initially, engine infrastructure had both Terraform and YAML in it. And then they decided at this point to separate in cluster and out of cluster provisioning into two separate repositories. So we have the Terraform, all the Terraforms migrated to an Atlantis repository. And like, please don't ever do this, like name your repository also Atlantis. It's really painful when you're trying to explain to like a SOC 2 auditor the difference between the code base and the tool, everything else. Um, but you know, the Kube, Kube manifest remained in engine infrastructure. And I was like, ah, oh, this is kind of cool. It's actually similar to like how civilizations expand. Like if you look at like ancient history, you're like, oh, I found some pottery over here. And now I found similar pottery over here. These two places must have been related somehow. Um, I, it was easier because I could look at like the issues, <laughs> but you know, it's, I think the metaphor holds. Um, one thing that I want to point out as well at this point is we're still operating out of like this mono project structure in clouds. So we have this one giant also called engine infrastructure cloud project and all cloud resources are provisioned into that project, including multiple clusters, DBs, buckets, service accounts, everything. And uh, foreshadowing again is, this is another one of these things where like, oh, that's where that started. Okay, cool. Um, so, you know, during those early GitOps days, so the dawn of the GitOps age of recursion, only cloud resources were provisioned with like quasi GitOps workflows, right? With, with the Atlantis workflow. Um, there was a brief four way with Keel at some point that appeared and disappeared in, in the historical record. Uh, and then, but it was in late 2021 that GitOps really took off at Recursion with the introduction of Argo for uh, continuous deployment. And uh, this led to this very long tail transition from the kube directory uh, to an Argo directory in that same uh, informal which I just, like, I'm sad to say actually only finished like last December. <laughs> so this was 2021 and yeah, it took some time. Um, but, you know, the, the cool thing about this was is that we'd entered this like kind of golden age of like developer experience at Recursion at this time, right? Um, developers could effortlessly request new infrastructure. It was a pull request away, right? Um, and they could deploy new versions of our tools at scale and at pace. And the company grew at this time. So this was when they entered hiring. I joined right after in 2022. So we started to scale out our, our engineering and our data science teams. 
and things were going so well. <laughs> Until, <laughs> as often happens, you fall victim of your own success, right? Um, uh, yeah. So, at first blush, this plot looks like success, right? Like on the far, far left, I guess, down there, you've got, you know, like the early days of, like the first days of Atlantis. On the far right, you're seeing a lot of traffic, like a lot of pull requests being opened against it. Aha. But who has to approve all of those pull requests? This team. <laughs> and, you know, granted, pull requests are like, not like the greatest, most precise indicator of like, you know, scaling. But in this case, they very much were. And, uh, yeah, this was, I had joined early 2022, so like right before like peak pain. And by mid-2023, we were reviewing hundreds of pull requests per month, right? Some of them like benign, some of them malformed. You know, it just, it, it, it became paralyzing at one point. And it was, you know, and there was a lot of new people, as often is the case when you scale your documentation lags. Like, it just became this horrible experience of constantly feeling like you're the, the barrier to that next innovation at the company, and we're an R&D company, that's what we do. Um, and the irony of all this <laughs> is that we should have seen it coming. We could have seen it coming. Um, so this diagram kind of shows a simple model of the belt-fed potato cannon that we created, like, and then pointed at ourselves, right? Um, Atlantis terraformed the world, which is great. Um, there's common cloud resources that everyone relies on, you know, network, DNS, a bunch of other stuff. Um, and then there's sort of the domain-specific cloud resources, databases, buckets, service accounts, secrets, that sort of thing, right? Engine infrastructure control deployment of all the things and, uh, you know, faithfully dump them into the default namespace because, whoops, right? Uh, and, you know, you, you find these. I'm still trying to find that commit, by the way, where it was like, wait, we, did we choose to do this or was it just like we defaulted the default? Um, and developers, in order to make changes to their stuff, would have to follow those errors. They pulled, their, open their pull request against the infrastructure models we had built. So there was some struggle. We we wired CI in and let CI kind of do tag updating so that like at least you know it would flow through. And as long as they pass our test suite and our security suite, like okay, we don't have to. There's no PR anymore. But that works when you're relatively stable. When you're creating new stuff, like it's hard to automate that. You know, you can't really. Like it's a lot of just like honestly, it's. Like, buying new Lego bricks and putting them on and seeing if it works. And so we, you know, anything interesting and complicated that we were building at that time required manual intervention. And, you know, I, I suppose we could have just let everyone just like commit to trunk, right? Or approve their own pull requests. And unsurprisingly, there was very minimal appetite for that <laughs> um, from our leadership, from our developers, pretty much everybody was like, no, we don't want that. Why? Because we'd built a human policy engine, right? That prevented us from making mistakes hopefully. But when you have that kind of volume of PRs, are you really giving them a great amount of attention? Or are you just like, looks good enough. You know, we'll fix it later. Um, so basically, we had installed this gate on our infrastructure. We'd built an automated system to just like send PRs our way and then just stood in front of it, right? And it was horrible. And um, many of you can probably recognize this. There's actually like an underlying, this is a symptom of an underlying problem. A company that's scaled faster than its process, right? That's what this is. You know, I don't have, there's no blame here, right? This is just a consequence of scaling and it happens. But it also, we, we built this process, the process was built in, with intention, right? But we had to accept the consequence of it. So this is basically summer of 2023. <laughs> We're sitting there with like our end infrastructure model repos like defending the world. <laughs> it's never been defeated, but oh my God. <laughs> like we just hired like, um, and I, I shouldn't refer to developers as orcs, but like some days, <laughs> you know. Um, so we were all sitting there wondering what can we do, right? And you know, many of you will probably recognize, hey, we're only like three months into 2024. It was like, that was less than a year ago. Right, like, how, how do you still have hair, Donnie? Um, you would be correct, excellent deductive work that we are very shortly removed from that period. And I still work at Recursion, which is, I think, impressive. Um, so the question becomes, you know, like, we've reached present day in our archeological journey. We're not digging anymore. We are doing the next thing, right? So we've, we've, we've kind of, we've gathered the pieces. We figured out how we got here. What are we going to do about this, right? So I want to let this soak. I'll give it like 15 seconds, just let it sit in, right? 
So it became very clear to me and to my team, uh, like in the fall, that we need to be more intentional about ownership. What do I mean by that? We may own the common infrastructure and be responsible for it and, like, and make sure that it's healthy, right? But we need to make clear the ownership of domain-specific infrastructure. We had to come up with patterns that allowed that ownership to be exercised. If you prevent people from making changes to things, do they really own it? Can they, in their mind, feel like they own it, right? It got to a point where we felt like people were just saying, hey, can you go build this for us, right? When, they, when we had created tools that would let them build it for themselves, but they didn't want to because they knew they'd have to come and get a pre-R approved from us anyways, right? Um, when you own something, you have some right to autonomously change it. And so we had to renegotiate the nature of ownership of infrastructure. Um, and one of my uh, employees at the time, he's moved on, but he had this saying, like, the system will impose its will. We had a system that imposed its will that said we were responsible for everything, right? And we needed to develop a new system that imposes a new will that renegotiates this relationship. We had to find a way to cede some control over infrastructure, right, while still maintaining assurance for all with respect to the common. So the first thing we did was we took the approach of our stuff in our repos, your stuff in yours, which is kind of true for like apps, but we can make it true for uh, infra as well. And this is like your classic separation of concerns, you know, like, I don't care about that. Why do I need to see it every day? Um, I only care about it when it comes talks to me. And so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to use this like fictional domain that I call like my bounded context or my BC. Um, thanks, lawyers. But uh, yeah, so this represents something owned by some arbitrary development team. Okay. And we talked a lot as a team. We spent probably way too much time talking now that I think about it. Um, but, uh, you know, about what represents like the boundary of ownership and where does it transition? And we kind of landed on this. So we are responsible for the core infrastructure and we will provision for you on your request two containers, for want of a better term, I know containers, but, you know, a namespace in Kates that you can provision into and is yours and a project in cloud that you can provision to and is yours. And we wire that to a repo that's yours that you can make changes to and you can manage on your own, right? So that was the first step. So let's make it very clear. What's yours, what's ours, right? That doesn't mean that we're like, don't work together anymore and we're not gonna help you. It's just, that's in your house. If I come to your house and I work on your sink, it's not my sink, right? Um, and that also made the contract very explicit. Um, so the next thing we did is entered what I've called the industrialized GitOps era, which is the era in today. So first I'm going to unpack what RxRx Rx Cloud is. So that is our core infrastructure repo. That's the repo we own. Now we decided to build it in run levels, right? So this is kind of a common pattern. You essentially lay down layers of infrastructure with dependencies, make sure dependencies flow the right direction. And we build up our infrastructure from bootstrapping our provisioning system, which is now Spacelift. Um, plug for Spacelift, it's a really great tool. I've really enjoyed using it. Um, so we've replaced Atlantis. Atlantis has sunk, but I'll explain more in a minute. Um, then once you have your provisioning up, then you bootstrap your organization, custom roles, everything else, folder structure, um, service perimeter, all those things. Then you build your network out, then core operations, so getting Argo, uh, cluster with Argo up so we can start provisioning other clusters and so on and so forth, right? So we build these layers. And eventually we get to run level 60, bounded context. What is that? That is the level where we provision out these namespaces and projects, okay? And we also, what we did was we standardized our tech stack at the same time. So we have RxRx Rx system. This is like every cluster is going to have the same base set of tech on it. And we built that and we said, we're going to own that. So no more like, I have my version of Grafana and you have your version of Grafana. It's like, there is one, <laughs> you know, one ring to rule them all. I don't know. Is that a Malzahn thing? I don't think so. Um, but, and then lastly, we have this, uh, we have this extra cluster that we provision called work because we apparently have really elastic workloads because we do a lot of experiments, turns out. So I learned. Um, so this was, this is what we owned and what we built. And like I said, in bounded contexts, we can provision, so we've called them environments. So by default, you get two environments. You get a prod environment and a dev environment. You can do whatever you want. If you don't want to use either of them, 
I don't care, but they're there, right? And we can give you assurance that in prod, prod stuff can talk to prod on the network, and in dev, dev stuff can talk to dev on the network. And if you want custom environments, you can provision custom environments, right? So in this model, what I've done is I've said, okay, well, we have this restricted environment where I want to like restrict access to specific data. They've asked for that. So we build out this like extra project that they can dump cloud resources in and then restrict access as the project trust boundary as opposed to some other set of, of policy. And um, in GCP, that's a really convenient boundary because a lot of like roles and permissions are project level, easy to assign. So now they have their environments. We're in their repo. So this is their infrastructure repo. And we've given them some, some nominal directory structure to work with, which we say don't, don't change because it'll break the automation. It's the GitOps part. We need to point to where is your code that we're gonna run, right? So the first thing at the top, I put don't touch this directory. And in it, we have germ as a, as a code name. I know, I'm sorry. But uh, <laughs> anyways, it's where we put all our birth certificates. So when you use our tools to provision stuff, we give a birth certificate, which we also call your certificate of warranty. Right? If you use our tools to write, like, to template out your Terraform or your YAML or whatever, and something goes wrong, we will come up and we will fix it and we will not be mad about it. <laughs> All right? We'll be mad at ourselves, not you, because it was our mistake. But we don't want to paint everybody into this tiny box if you can only provision these things, so we give them the freedom to do extra, but that's the distinction. It won't show up there, so that's how we know, like, yeah, you, we didn't make this. We, we'll help you, but, like, you put the new engine in the car. I don't know what this one looks like. Right? Um, the next directory after that is the deploy directory. And this consolidates that domain-specific YAML, right, that is used to deploy in-cluster resources into the namespace that they own, right? So this we wire up. Um, you can wire to CI uh, so that it goes all the way through from the commit on trunk in the application uh, directory all the way through tag update and into whatever environment they want. Um, I recognize that this, like, is not very dry, like, and this, it's a consequence of we're migrating. So we have a lot of custom stuff. We try to do dry net, we try to dry it up as we're moving it, probably gonna make a mistake. So we'll just, we'll give it some spots to move into its new home and we'll kick the ball down the road and hopefully come to it maybe <laughs> sooner rather than later. But at least we've moved it, right? Um, and there, there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of the value files and like we're trying to get things leveled up to the same Helm, version, Helm template versions and stuff like that. So just, this is the smart move, trust me on this one. All right, uh, so after deploy, um, we have infrastructure. And in this case, each subdirectory represents a environment and all the Terraform for that environment goes there. And we have a stack that runs each subdirectory. So if you wanna update your you know, dev environment with add a secret or add a service account or whatever you want. You can put the Terraform there. It will pick, the uh, Sayslift will pick it up and execute it for you. And it's up to you to decide if you want it to auto deploy or like add an extra layer of like permissioning or what have you, right? Do you want a PR workflow? It's your repo, you choose, right? I don't care, right? What I care about is that it exists and it's provisioning and will come help you if things break. Um, and so in this example, right, We've got basically a prod and a dev environment that are kind of parity. They're just each have different, they're on different networks. And then we have that restricted data environment that is the bucket in the database. So really simple example. It actually like follows a pretty common pattern in drug discovery and in pharma where you need to restrict certain pieces of your data to limited access. And then the last directory is new. We created this directory called the access control. We actually put consolidated all the permissions there. Why? Uh, SOC 2 audits kind of suck when it's spread all over the place. So being able to just do a git log against that path and see all the changes to permissions and have policy that prevents permission changes in any other path was really nice. It's like, it just here you go, auditors. Fill your boots. Um, so this is the current state of the world that we're moving to. We're not fully there yet, but this is the current state of the world we're moving to. And I think it's really neat um, to look at this was where we were seven years ago, right? One TF file, state in the repo, some manually applied manifests. Let's see if we can go back, can I go back? Yeah, to this, which is you know, very nicely organized for people to be autonomous and choose what they want to do when within a, a boundary that prevents them from exploding everybody else's stuff, right? And we've effectively, what we've done is we've removed ourselves from being the explicit in the way and to more of what we want to be, which is 
will help you, right? Will help you when you get stuck, as opposed to we're going to check all your work all the time. All right. Um, so, I'm going to share some conclusions. Um, so, there's two parts to this talk. The first one was talking about like spelunking through Git and like other you know company histories to kind of understand how you got here. And you know, I've been at Recursion for two years, like I said, the company's been around for a lot longer than that. And you know, this is pretty obvious. I kind of needed to have some summary at the end. But like, yeah, the structure of your code today emerged from decisions made yesterday. And likely by others, many of whom probably don't work here anymore. Right? Like that's just the nature of business, is that people will move on, they'll change jobs, they'll do whatever they do, they move to Europe, who knows. But the point is that like, it's worth examining how you arrived at today's code by looking at it. Not by just waiting for people to tell you, but by actually going and looking at it, going and doing your own excavation, right? Um, in order to inform the changes you will make tomorrow, right? It was worth knowing how we got to those mono repos and why the, and what decisions were made along the way and how that influenced the structure of that code to help influence the next bound. And that you can only do by looking at it. Um, and the other kind of takeaway from that was they embraced GitOps. Like we had this dawn, this golden age of GitOps, and it allowed us to move at speed until we couldn't. And it really, you can only move at speed with GitOps if the teams that are applying, like that are making the changes, have the autonomy to see those changes enacted. If you put a barrier in the way, right, and they do not have true intentional ownership of those things, then they will just slow down and it leads to headbutting and morale suck. So my advice is that GitOps Con is don't fall into that trap. You know, be thoughtful about ownership before you start bringing in this automation because that's really what's gonna hurt you in the long run if you don't have thoughtful ownership by design. And then lastly, you know, there's lots of patterns. So in like my abstract, like, oh, there's two patterns. There's way more than two patterns, obviously. The two patterns that we considered were the pattern we had before and the pattern we're adopting and just kind of putting them against each other, right? So before we had these common to all infrastructure monorepos and there are some nice things about that, you know? Um, they tend to limit it on me and that actually might be a good thing, right? It might be a good that, you know, people, like we had data scientists who were making changes to things and they didn't know and that's okay, they're not supposed to, but it's good that they couldn't make those changes and have them show up in real life, right? As my five-year-old says, in real life. Um, they also are minimal effort to maintain consistency. And what I mean by that is because you're gating change, you can actually audit for consistency a lot easier. You don't have this kind of like Cambrian explosion of, of ideas, right? Um, they're good for what I, like the figuring out phase of a hill chart when you don't know things yet. Impose the minimum amount of structure you can to let people have space to explore and walk that path with them, right? That's what this is good for. Um, but it, it scales only linearly with team size. So if we, we, the other way we could have dealt with this is just hired a bunch of people and just had a rotation of who's gonna review the PRs today, and that would have been terrible, right? Um, but it is possible. But the point is, is like you can make that decision as you look at your scale, as you're scaling. For us, we were scaling way faster than that, and so we had to make a different choice. And then on the other flip side, you know, it's, it's a lot of the foils, right? So like bounded context, these, these bespoke, or these tailor-made repos for teams, facilitate their autonomy, they can make, we've given them a, a framework to and implant their own changes. We've uh, had this extra effort we need to uh, enforce to maintain consistency. So we've built some tooling around like templating and with this warranty idea. So we incentivize, use the standards and then we can help you faster. But we're not gonna tell you you have to, right? And then it's good for the getting it done phase. Like this is where we're, we kind of know our domains. We know how to run high throughput experimentation systems. We know how to build ML models. We know what we're doing at this point. We're doing more of it, right? So this is where having that autonomy to make those minor tweaks to your infrastructure, those tiny changes that can unlock that next level of performance matters and doing it quickly. And then lastly, it scales quasi independently of infrastructure team size because you're delegating some of that review to the dev teams themselves and to policy that you write. But again, policy only happens after you've kind of figured out what you want your policy to be. If you write it beforehand, you'll achieve the opposite problem, which is you'll not know why everything's failing because somebody wrote a policy seven years ago that like is still happens to be in effect because it's buried somewhere. Um, okay, so thanks for putting up with my rambles. First session of the day. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I am really looking forward. This is my first GitOps Con, my first time in Seattle. 
Um, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions or take any questions afterwards. Thanks.